Well, as you might guess, uh, we are actually going to be um, retro-writing our Apple II GS monitor. This is a standard Apple Color RGB monitor. This will work on the 2GS, the 2C, the 2C+, and possibly even later versions of the 2E, like the, uh, the one that was discontinued in 1993. So, to do this, we have to, uh, to retrobite it, we have to completely disassemble the monitor down to its core componentry. This is not for the weak of heart or the inexperienced. I know that sounds a little arrogant, but it's the truth. You can easily screw up a CRT and kill yourself by working on a CRT um, without following some very important guidelines. Let's talk a little bit about discharge probes. This is the tool that I'm going to be using for the job. This is an official Apple service tool, um, part number 0760381. Now this includes the discharge probe and, oops, and a grounding um, jumper. Now the discharge probe this is what a real one looks like. Um, it contains some form of energy suppression, I believe in the form of a large resistor. It's designed to bleed off the current, um, it's not slowly, but slow enough to prevent uh, sparks and other horrible things from happening. Um, you don't want to shock the componentry. You could actually damage um, some sensitive electronics if it, if, if it were ever to just go off at once. Um, so that's why you, when you make your own probe, which you'll have to because these are fairly coveted tools, you pretty much can't get them anywhere anymore. Um, it's important that you allow for some bleed off, and you're going to want to do that by inserting a resistor in line. In fact, I'm going to measure the probe's resistance just to see what we have uh, on the official tool. So it looks like we have... a. I'm going to say a 5 ohm resistor. No, 1 ohm. There's a 1 ohm resistor in there. That's what it appears to be. Yep, 1 ohm. So now you know what you need. So you need a 1 ohm resistor. If you're going to make your own tool, and the instructions are, are usually found online, people make these all the time. People who work in the arcade repair business and uh, general... Uh, CRT repair business, while those who are left. Anyway, uh, this jumper lead is designed to ground the uh, the aperture or the anode lead to the chassis while it's disassembled because electricity can, just like how a rechargeable battery can seem completely dead, but you let it sit on a shelf for a little while and whatever charge is left in it eventually builds back up again and uh, Maybe an electrical engineer could explain that better than I can, but anyway, <laughs> it's for your safety and to ensure that it stays discharged. That way you don't pick it up and, <laughs> you know. Because remember, there are other capacitors within the chassis that can bleed energy back into the flyback and recharge it. To a, not 100% capacity, but enough to give you a good shock. And that's why the tool... Oh, by the way, that little jumper um, does have a fuse... Um, built in. I don't know what the what the amperage is on it, but I believe it's a 14 amp fuse. It said 14 on it, so I think that means 14 amps. But anyway, that's that's a lot of amperage. But anyway, there's a fuse in there, and you've got the uh, the jumper. So uh, be safe and use the right tools because you could you could hurt yourself. Back. Pull the back cover off vertically. Now it's also a good idea. To only do this if the monitor has been shut off for at least a week or so, because you don't want to take any chances with your life. Now it looks like the um, yeah, there's some controls mounted to the uh, back cover here. The power switch and uh, contrast and brightness controls are mounted to the back of the monitor, so we have to unplug them. One thing is important, you only work with one hand. When you're working with a CRT, work with one hand, not two. Because, for example, if you accidentally touch the ground, the chassis ground, and the aperture, or the 
any charged component, the voltage can go sent, can be sent straight through your heart and can stop it cold. Um, so you work with one hand. You can take a shock with one hand, um, although it's not um, recommended by the FDA. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to clip this to the chassis ground, like so. Now, there's one other thing you want to, you want to be aware of is that uh, that's not a very good contact. Let me try getting a, a little bit, a little better there. There we go. A couple of things you need to know about uh, chassis and all the grounding and whatnot. Um, <laughs> you can just all right. These are designed in most cases to bleed off the excess voltage when they're shut off. Uh, most modern CRTs are designed that way. But sometimes those circuits can fail. They don't always work like they're supposed to. It happens. It's a fact of life as they age. The other thing is, sometimes, um, you know what? It's just better to be safe than sorry. But what you got to do is stick this little probe here. Now, look at how insulated that is. Damn it. It keeps popping off. i got to find a better... That's good. That's going to hold it. All right. So we got to stick this under there. And you may hear a... Or a or a pop and the point of the matter is you want to get it touching the metal clips inside there like so now this kit also includes this little doohickey here this is designed to prevent it from recharging itself sometimes they can recharge themselves over time uh, voltages can you know move from one component to the other or whatever and they can sometimes regenerate enough current to, to zap you, not to kill you. And this is what you're supposed to ground the cap to the chassis with when it's being worked on. <clears throat> At least that's the idea. So, we know we've, we've got it contacting the uh, clip there. So we're going to take this cap off. But yeah, it was an online course that I had to, t uh, to take. And uh, it was basically just a couple of questions. It really wasn't extensive. Just enough to not kill yourself, really, the whole point was. So we've got to unclip by squeezing the uh, cap. Usually there's like one hook on either side, and if you get one, you can get the other one. Like I said, it's been a long time since I've ever done this. The last time I did this was when I rebuilt my air cap. There it goes. I unclipped it. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take our little tool here. We're going to attach it to the chassis ground first. And then we're going to clip it to the, oops, to the cap here. And that's just to keep it grounded and to prevent any stray voltages from resurfacing. Okay, if all goes well, you won't see any sparks and I didn't I didn't get shocked, I didn't get killed. Very cool. Now it looks like this chassis is assembled. So you got to you want to try to study how it's how it's put together before you start ripping your you know the guts out. It looks like what we'll be able to do here is remove the CRT. Actually, I want to remove the board. And that's held in by two big giant screws that hold the, um, the implosion ring in place. A little word on implosion rings. It sounds scary because it is. Actually, it's very scary. You'll go on, if you go on YouTube, you'll find many videos of people shooting CRTs out with, you know, BB guns and hammers and whatnot. And the CRT gracefully implodes um, in, a, in a very constructed, very controlled manner. So, and then you're going to find some videos of CRTs being smashed with the implosion rings removed. That's a very stupid thing to do. Very stupid thing to do. I don't like to judge people based on what they do, but that's a very stupid, very dangerous thing to do. Alright, let's talk about why that's dumb. 
But first, we're going to get the CRT out so we can take a look at it. Um, now, the chassis should be pretty much loose. It looks like the CRT goes on on top of it, which makes my life a living hell. <laughs> it's a little more difficult to work on that way, but okay. I get what they're trying to do here. I'm going to screw all these things here. Now, CRTs in this condition are starting to get rare. Now, they're not impossible to find, but uh, they're, they're getting harder to find by the day. So we don't want to screw this up. This is something we want to get it done once and do it right. Hold on. Put the camera down. Okay. I got that little piece of framework out of there. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to pull the... Um, we're going to pull the... Uh, the electronics out of it, but it looks like we won't be able to do that quite yet. Again, you got to study how it's put together, make sure we can do this as planned. I think I might be able to pull the whole unit out. Once. I think I'm going to change course here. It looks like I'm going to have to pull the board out, disconnect everything. So I've got to disconnect this wire here. This goes to the, um, and it's labeled right there. This goes to the degaussing coil. There should be, I believe, two leads going to that. No, I need to see the one. Then we're going to disconnect uh, this connector, which goes to the power LED. And it's kind of wrapped around a few different standoffs, which we have to all, they all have to be disconnected. We're actually going to pull the aperture, or I'm sorry, the gun control board. Um, I forget what this is called. The driver board. That's got to come off. I'm a little rusty on my terminology. I don't do a lot of CRT repairs. I do just enough to, you know, keep things running at work. And uh, I've come fairly reasonably good. I've done CRT swaps on used IMAX. And that can be very interesting because the boards and everything are all aligned. To see, every CRT is different, okay? They all have their little quirks during manufacturing. So the driver boards have to be aligned to the specific CRT. So when you're swapping them around, you sometimes have to play with them a little bit to get them to work correctly, especially if they're used. Electronics age over time, and they kind of age together. So it's, it's a little, bit of a battle sometimes when you're dealing with that kind of stuff. But... All right, there we go. Just, just disconnect that. This goes out to the front for the uh, power LED. There we go, we'll get that out of the way. This actually goes to this grounding strap that, go, that wraps around the entire CRT. And then there should be a couple other uh, cables that are probably all... Ah, uh, here we go. Or I'm going to take the entire board off, the entire driver board, which means I have to loosen up... Uh, maybe I don't. No, it's held in by doping compound. So we're going to have to remove that little bit of doping compound. Usually, by this point, it's all aged out and dried. And it just falls right off. go. Didn't bend any pins. That's a best case scenario. This is the CRT neck. Now if you damage any of these pins or break the neck off, the CRT is garbage. So don't do that. Be very careful. Don't touch these pins. Don't fondle them. Don't clean them. Leave them the hell alone. And then we've got this cable here. This goes to the uh, this goes to the CRT neck. This is actually so terminology. This is like um, this is the deflection coil, and this is the CRT gun itself. This is what really generates the image. The deflection coil connects directly using these to the board using those cables there. Those have to be undone. To get the board out, I've got to disconnect this uh, shield 
from the chassis rail, like so. And that, there's one on the other side. And I've got a ground cable that has to be done as well. So the reason I'm going through all this trouble is because the CRT is placed on top of the chassis rail. And I can't, I don't want to pull them out as one unit. And that would be very dangerous. Especially in, my con in the confines of my home. But if you want to be a player, you got to learn how to play. I love that song, Shaggy, It Wasn't Me. It came out when I was in, uh, what, ninth grade, tenth grade? Anyway. Okay, so now this board should be free to be removed. Nextly, we've got to remove the CRT itself. But first, we've got to take this degaussing coil out of the way. So we've got our CRT removed from its uh, encapsulation and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about CRT implosion protection. Now the CRT is comprised of two sections of glass that are bonded together with an adhesive. In fact you can see the adhesive around here. Typically I believe the adhesive is behind the band. But in order to assemble these, you, ha you can't just uh, form the glass around the electronics. You have to place the electronics and gun and everything and coat the inside of it while it's apart. The shadow mask is mounted right about here. And in order for all that to work, it has to be done disassembled, which means that it has to be assembled and then placed under vacuum. Because the face of the CRT has to be relatively flat to make it viewable, they can't make it as a, like a giant ball. Now a ball would, kind of like an egg, the atmospheric pressure, because remember this is below atmospheric pressure, would cause the egg or the, uh, or the ball or sphere uh, to evenly disperse the internal tension around the envelope. Now if you had a flat piece of glass and it was under vacuum, that flat piece of glass would bow inward and eventually it may, depending on how, how fragile it is, it could crack and implode. To make these CRTs implosion proof, um, the face of the CRT is curved, kind of like an arch bridge. And that allows the atmospheric pressure to evenly disperse over the surface of the of the face of the tube. And that force is then transferred to here, to the back of the CRT, which creates a high amount of, of tension around the seam. Because the CRT face wants to implode as the back also has a tendency to want to implode. And to prevent, in, in early CRTs, if they were damaged in any way, they would actually implode violently, sending, sending shards of glass all over the room. And it could, in fact, impale human skin or flesh. But to prevent that from happening, they've developed the anti-implosion band. The implosion band provides a, a, an opposite force to the high stress area of the CRT. It basically kind of holds it together and, and shores it up. So that way, if the CRT is ever compromised, resulting in a violent inrush of pressure, the glass won't blow outward. It'll, or the face, if it's ever, ever broken, it won't blow outward, it'll actually collapse inward. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, I don't know. I'm very bad at explaining. Which means that if this band is ever cut off, it could result in a very dangerous situation. Anyway, we're going to brush away some of the dust from the... Uh, there we go. Just like that. We don't want to touch any potentiometers. We don't want to disalign anything. We're just going to clean it up a little bit you know, to make it look nice because everyone knows that a CRT that looks nice on the inside somehow makes me feel better. Um, <laughs> okay. Just 
clean it up. What the hell? It's a part. Now these little, um, what these look, these look like little wafers or levers. Uh, these are actually magnetic rings, and these are adjusted at the factory to adjust the uh, permanently adjust the convergence of the three guns. There's three guns in here. This is a color monitor, so there's three. And uh, they have to be aligned just so, so that you don't have any bleed through from one number to the, or for one character to the next, or from one pixel to the next. And these right here are adjusted very carefully under laboratory settings. And the reason, excuse me, the reason this is necessary is because the manufacturing process of a CRT leaves a lot of variances in, uh, from one CRT to the next. So the guns and the CRT assembly have to be carefully matched together and all three guns have to be carefully aligned together to produce a crisp image. Over time, these magnetic rings can lose their magnetism and cause the guns to misalign or a traumatic experience or a failure within one of the guns can cause a misalignment issue or a convergence issue. So it's very important that these aren't really touched uh, during the disassembly or reassembly of the CRT. Just very lightly dusting them isn't going to hurt anything, um, but you also want to be very careful not to break them or to move them at all. Because getting them realigned outside of a laboratory setting without the proper test pattern and the proper knowledge of how they are to be aligned can be a devastating thing to happen and sometimes you just can't ever get it right again. But occasionally as the electronics or the driver of the uh, CRT ages and the values start drifting on some of the resistors and capacitors it can be necessary to readjust those guns to compensate for that. And that can be done uh, with the proper tools and know-how. All right, this CRT is good to go. Uh, prior to testing, or prior to disassembly, I did make sure that the CRT was worth all this effort. Um, it can be very difficult um, to repair them once they start to go off to the wrong direction. Uh, so this CRT, like I said, it's been fully tested. Um, displays images perfectly and has no issues uh, with, with any image quality. It does have a slight whistle on startup and that can be caused by um, failing capacitors or a failing, actually more more likely a failing, um, not really failing, just kind of an aging uh, flyback transformer. Typically the whining or whistling noise is caused by the rings in the flyback transformer vibrating against each other. That's actually what but I was told by a TV technician many years ago. But he also told me that a television can whistle for years and years and years and never have a problem. <laughs> so um, that's kind of where we are with this one. It has that whistle, which is very typical uh, of a CRT that's this old. Um, as a matter of fact, these old CRTs were built better than the new ones, our newer ones. Uh, so they can go many, 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 many years before they actually fail. Now, on a machine that's not being used in a production setting anymore, isn't going to get a lot of use. So it's important that, uh, that we acknowledge that and not go crazy fixing stuff that doesn't need to be fixed. One more thing. Um, while the CRT is out, it's a good opportunity to clean it um, because we can clean areas that we can't clean otherwise. You have to be very mindful of the neck. It can be easy to break it off. And once you do... Well, it's it's a bad thing, um, <laughs> a very bad thing, uh, because you have to replace the whole thing at that point. If you ever have to decompress or or depressurize or pressurize, equal equalize the pressure, sorry, of a CRT, the best way to do that, and I've actually done this, the best and easiest way to do that is to jab a screwdriver down into this hole and break the tip of the uh, of the uh, the electron gun um, assembly just break the tip off and that'll cause air to to slowly rush into the to the cavity it won't be violently enough it won't be violent it'll be very slow 
Um, some people just take a hammer to the neck and crack it, and once you do that, of course, that'll happen too. Uh, so it's not necessarily good or bad. It's a, it's, well, it's the proper way to decompress a CRT, um, or to depressurize, or what have you. What was I going to say? Yeah, uh, don't break this loose. Don't loosen that, and be safe. Um, because you can uh, you can misalign the uh, deflection coil, causing uh, well alignment issues. The black coating that you see here is called Aquadag and can be repaired. If it's ever scratched, it can be repaired. What it actually does is it blocks um, light from entering the back of the unit. Um, and it may even have some properties for um, preventing radiation exposure. But I'm not really sure on that. I should look into it, though. But Aquadag does get damaged uh, during handling of a CRT sometimes, if you're not careful. Um, but there, you can actually buy Aquadag or Aquadag online, and you can repair what you've damaged if if that had happened to you. So, all right, I've cleaned the face of my CRT. And also, don't if you're if you're going to do that, do not lay it on its side with the um, with the neck or deflection coil touching any surface. It's just bad practice. You can damage the neck. You can break it off even without being without even being uh, aware of it. It's also a bad idea to store or transport the CRT upside down. If you do, if you do end up placing the CRT the other way around with the neck down, um, what you have to do or what you should do is flip it back around and tap it a few times. Because what can happen is little particles of, of conductive material that happen to occur during the use and construction of a, a new CRT, they can go back into the neck area and short out one or more guns, um, which would effectively destroy the CRT. So it's best practice not to store the CRT face up. Always store it face down, and uh, like I said, you know, make sure that you follow the proper procedures for, uh, yeah. I think you got that. Now I'm going to go ahead and take my paintbrush and I'm going to try to clean off the board a little bit, remembering to stay very clear and of the uh, potentiometers and rheostats and such, trimmers, trim adjustments, what have you, because I don't want to throw anything off. This little device here is called a flyback transformer. This is what we were talking about when we were talking about the whistling and... Uh, other issues. This is what generates the high voltage, or what it does is it, through the magic of inversion, it uh, generates up to, I think it's what, 30 kilovolts or something like that? <laughs> that's a lot of voltage. 30 kilovolts or so. I believe that's what they usually put out. So just brush the dust off, everything, clean it up. We are doing a restoration video after all, so. We don't take anything in half measures. Uh, shouldn't be there. Just be very careful when working around these boards. Don't be like me. I'm not careful enough. I oh, hello. Uh, right now we're removing the power LED. Next show. Take that out. We can leave the plastic, uh, clear plastic behind. All right. Oh, I'm going to salvage these little washers. And I'm going to just check for any breakage in the plastic before I go any further. I may have to do some repairs to the plastics. Oh, look, a staple. Hm. That's something you really don't want to find inside a monitor. But this computer originally served its life in a school district, so I'm not shocked by what I'm seeing at all. So that's the uh, the bezel, and I'm going to pop the Apple logo off. I found that the Apple logos, which are made of aluminum and they're silk screened, can be damaged by the solution. It's a little bit caustic, so um, we're going to just pop that out with a toothpick, or try to. If I can't, then I can't, you know what I mean? I'm not going to go crazy. 
but I'd like to remove it safely. There, I just broke the damn toothpick. Let's try to find something a little, little. Okay, now it's time to remove that. And it appears to be, oh, it's just one big assembly. One big happy oh. assembly. I like that. Just one screw. And the whole thing might come off. Get my screw cup. See, we have to make sure that these wheels are also treated because they're also yellowed. So we have a, a special bin for those parts. Oh, cramity. Looks like they're too close together to pop them out. The way I want to. Well, that sucks. That's all right. Let's loosen up the little back nut here. We just don't want to get these mixed up because, uh, well, one's contrast, one is brightness. And I don't want to uh, mess up that harmony, you know. But one of these has to be loosened, like so. I actually had to loosen up the, uh, I believe it's the contrast one. Come on. Here we go. And that goes in there. Alright, now we can take the other one off. Right in there. And then the power switch should just pop right out. I think. So now all the visible plastics will be treated and we won't uh, have to deal with this again. Serviceman warning, x-ray precaution. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Nice. When was this sucker made? Looks like it was manufactured. I say it was 1988 sometime in 98. 11 of 98. Yeah, could be. Interesting. Because the other component to this was manufactured in 1987. So, actually, I believe that just that just means the mold was made in 1988. So that's that's actually sensible. All right. So now we're ready to bleach our plastics. Unfortunately, the weather is not conducive to such behavior. So, that's why we're doing this now, so that tomorrow, first thing in the morning, I can make my, uh, my gel. I bought some saran wrap, and uh, we'll see what happens. So, catch you uh, tomorrow. I'll resume filming. Well, the weather outside has been frightful. Um, all day long, so I haven't really been able to retrobrite the uh, the 2GS monitor. I tried to earlier today, but it, it wasn't. Ha this is pretty much what we're, what we have right now um, in terms of color. <laughs> um, I did I, I had it out for for a couple hours today, um, but the overcast was was too intense. I just wasn't getting the results. Um, so what I'm going to do is wait for a, a much better day, and hopefully I'll start the process all over again. Uh, so we're going to conclude this video uh, at this point. Now, finishing the retrobite process uh, can be uh, outlined, or you can learn how to do it by watching my video on the Apple IIGS system unit retrobiting process. Uh, once you get the device down to the shell like this. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. You just basically um, make your gel. I, I do recommend using the cornstarch uh, formula that I used um, in the Apple II GS video uh, early on. 
cornstarch formula has one advantage. It it turns into a paste that that clings to the plastic longer than uh, just the liquid form would. So, ideally, if you had enough uh, hydrogen peroxide and you could fill a few clear tubs with peroxide and oxyclean, you know that would be ideal. But that would require massive amounts of uh, peroxide. We're talking gallons of peroxide and a much bigger plastic tub than, than I have. Uh, but it would probably work better and more evenly. Um, one thing I learned in this process is that the 2GS has a built-in monitor stand, or at least the RGB monitor has a built-in stand, that snaps onto the bottom. Normally it comes like this. It's flat. But if you mount it like this, allows the monitor to elevate slightly. So that's a, a nifty little feature. I found it by accident. I didn't even know it did that. So uh, stay tuned. Um, when I start working on the 2GS a little more, when I get it set up at a permanent location in my home, and we start uh, getting software set up on it, um, you'll get to see what the end result was. Um, but like I said, for the rest of this week, it's supposed to be basically overcast and uh, it, it just... See, the thing is, this is, a, this is a very... You have to babysit this. You don't just stick it out there and go to work and come back and it's done. you got to babysit it the whole time. You've got to keep reapplying the gel. And you've got to keep making sure that, the, that whatever you're, you're, you're uh, lightening up, whatever you're working with is rotated. Because, you know, not all four sides get the same amount of sunlight. So you got to keep rotating it, you know, go out there every few minutes and turn it like a clock. Um, not only that, the sun also moves too, so, in relation to the earth. So you've got to really keep an eye on it. Um, the other thing I've found is if you do the plastic wrap method, um, you got to be careful because you can get striping um, and unevenness in your, uh, in your retrobrite um, surface or in your in your lightened or bleached surface uh, which can be pretty you know ugly so you gotta you might have to redo that as well so I, I had one floppy drive that had some zebra striping so I've got to redo that um, again which should be loads of fun 